how to develop intimacy with the Holy Spirit. And I'm taking my text from the book of John chapter 16, verse 13. John 16, verse 13. It reads, and I quote, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Holy Spirit, we adore you. We acknowledge your presence in this place. We ask that, I ask that you use me as a vessel to speak to your people. Let me speak out of the fullness of, of, of the depth of, of, of your treasures, uh, of your treasury. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you open our eyes of understanding. As the word proceed, let it enter into our hearts. Uh, let there be illum illumination. Let there be revelation. Let there be insight. Let this word bring transformation to us. Let this word propel us to develop a, 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 a deeper work with you in the name of Jesus. Every embargo placed on our spiritual growth, every embargo placed on our work with you, hindering us from going deeper in you. We declare that such embargo is lifted right now in the name of Jesus. As the heavens were opened over Jesus, I declare that the heavens are open over us. Not that the heavens have been shut in the past, but we declare that even greater dimensions of open heavens we will experience, we will receive this morning in the name of Jesus. Lord, on the day that you were baptized, the heaven, the heaven was open and the Holy Spirit came down like a dove and the voice of, of God came saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I pray that today the heavens are opened over this meeting. Let the Holy Spirit descend upon us and may we hear your voice unto each and every person here today in the name of Jesus. So shall it be. Let everyone under the sound of my voice be blessed. For in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Now the dictionary defines intimacy as a close, familiar, and usually affectionate or loving personal relationship with another person. Thank you, sir. It is defined as a close association with or detailed knowledge or deep understanding of a person. So talking about intimacy, we're looking specifically at developing intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Now, there are three factors that facilitate intimacy with the Holy Spirit. If you like, call it factors or you call it element. Three factors that facilitate intimacy with the Holy Spirit. The first one is companionship. Let someone say companionship. Now, the dictionary defines companionship as the enjoyment of spending time with someone or other people. There are certain people in our lives, especially our spouse, with whom we, we, we cherish our association, we cherish and remarkably enjoy their company. And that's because perhaps they make us laugh, they inspire us to do more and to become more, or maybe they make us feel loved, appreciated, and cared for, or they compliment you, they are responsive to your needs, they say the right things and they tell you the truth, you feel encouraged whenever you're around them, they, they are fun to be around, and they have a whole lot of value to you. And so because of such people, you want to spend time around them. You don't want to spend time with someone who tolerates you, but rather you want to spend time with someone who appreciates you, who says sweet things to you, and can also look you in the eye, in the eye and tell you that you are wrong. Now, similarly, we cannot develop intimacy with the Holy Spirit without enjoying spending time with Him. The things we value, we make time for. The things we hold in high esteem, we create time for such things. In Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42, the Bible told us that Jesus visited the home of Martha. And uh, whilst Martha was trying to make arrangements for Jesus to serve him, the Bible told us that of about Mary, the sister of Martha, how she sat at the feet of Jesus in a communion with Jesus. 
hearing the words of Jesus. And Martha made a statement saying, the Lord, do you not care that Martha, I mean, Mary is not joining me, joining me to serve you? Therefore, ask Martha to join me. I'm sorry, ask Mary to join me. And Jesus said to Martha, he said, Martha, Martha, hallelujah. Maybe please call your neighbor and tell them, call your neighbors if you know their name, and, and or you can even say, neighbor, neighbor. You are troubled about so many things. Let's go to that scripture so we can read together. Luke chapter 10. Hello, somebody. Luke chapter 10, verse 30. Uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 39, I think. Verse, yeah, verse 40 says, But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached the Lord, saying, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried about and troubled with so many things. You can say to your neighbor, 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 you are worried and concerned about so many things. You're worried and concerned about so many things. Worrying about your job. Worrying about your marriage. Worrying about that project. Worrying about your future. Worrying about your finances. Worrying about that relationship. Worrying about your career. Worrying about your health. Worrying about so many things. And Jesus said, but one thing is needed, verse 42. And Mary has chosen that good path which will not be taken away from her. One thing is needful. Your fellowship with the Lord. Because it is in the place of fellowship that the Lord will share deep things with you about your future. The things you are worried about. The things you are concerned about. The things you are afraid of. It is when you fellowship with him that he will share Things He will give you hope. He will give you life. He will encourage you. That's what the Holy Spirit is called, our helper. It was the same Mary who broke the alabaster box. The Bible says a very expensive oil made from spikenard. Now, spikenard was not found in Jerusalem in those days. It was imported from India. And it cost about 300 denarii which is a whole year's wage. One denary is one day wage. And so this woman took this alabaster box full of oil of spikenard, uh, spark, spikenard, and what did she do? The Bible says she broke it. You know, when you have your perfume, you spray it. And some of us, you spray your, you know, you spray your perfume, you know, you gently and, you know, uh, 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 sc- what's the word now? Sparingly. You just do boom, boom. Or you actually spray where people will smell. So you spray your ears. Bam, bam. So when people hug you, they can smell the perfume. Hello, somebody. <laughs> but look at what this woman did. The Bible says she broke the alabaster box. Now, the alabaster box also is not a cheap material. It was carved. It's not a cheap material. But what did she do? She broke the alabaster box and emptied the whole perfume on Jesus. What a love. A whole year's worth of salary, she gave everything to the Lord. What love. And she loved the Lord so much. And Jesus said when other people were castigating her, saying, what was she wasting this kind of money? It could have been sold and given to the poor. And Jesus said, see, well, we know who said that was Judas. But look at what Jesus said. He said, uh, leave her alone. She's doing it for my burial. And Jesus made a word. He said, everywhere the gospel is preached, this woman's name, Mary, will be mentioned. We're mentioning her name today. Despite the fact that this happened over 2,000 years ago. Mary. Mary. Now, there's another kind of Mary called Mary Magdalene. This is different from Mary, the sister of Martha. The Bible told us about this Mary, that she was the one who was with Jesus in his dying moments on the cross. There, are three, there were about five people with Jesus. Uh, uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary's mother's, uh, I mean, sorry, Mary's sister. 
uh, Mary, the, one, the, the wife of uh, Celia, I can't remember the name, John and, um, and Mary Magdalene. There were five of them. And so at Jesus' dying time, Jesus went, the, the, you know, it was a crucial moment for Jesus. And Mary Magdalene did not leave his side. He stood with him. A friend in need is a friend indeed. She was the last person to leave. She was with Jesus until Jesus was buried. And on the first day of the week, she was the first person to go to the tomb to apply, you know, uh, what's it called, uh, myrrh and spices around to the body of Jesus. And she was the first person that saw Jesus when Jesus resurrected. You can't desire companionship with the Lord without the Lord revealing himself to you. If you desire him to spend time with him, to fellowship with him, he will reveal himself to you. We talked about last week, there's a difference between relationship and fellowship. That you have relationship with someone does not mean that you are in fellowship with them. And we give an example of distant cousins and, and uncles or aunts, uh, aunts where you, you have relationship with them, but you've not seen them in two, three, four, five years. Now, many of us have relationship with God. We have relationship with the Holy Spirit, but we lack fellowship with him. And that's what the Lord, where the Lord is calling us onto this morning. Fellowship with the Holy Spirit. The Bible told us in Acts chapter 13 verse 2. The Bible says, as the minister to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas for the work to which I have called them. Now the key word there is, as the minister to the Lord and fasted. As the minister to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit ministered unto them. He spoke to them saying, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas for the work which, work which I have for them. So it is when we minister to the Lord, that is when the Lord ministered to us. What the Lord told them was about their purpose, about their future, about their assignment. Similarly, the Lord is waiting for you to draw close to him so that he can reveal your future, his plans, his purposes for your life to you. In 1 Samuel chapter 3 verse 1, the Bible told us about the boy Samuel. Now, the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. And there was no widespread revelation. Verse 4. But the Lord called to Samuel. The Lord wanted to minister to Samuel. He was a young boy. Amen. Now, the reason why the word of God was rare in those days was because no one ministered to the Lord except Samuel. The reason why the word goes scarce, we don't hear the word, is because we don't spend enough time in fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. If you can patiently wait on Him, you will hear His voice. And we sit together here this afternoon. Remember the story of Anna, the mother of Samuel. She was a woman who was barren, and she went to God and said, God, give me a child, and I will give him back unto you. And God gave Anna this child uh, Samuel, and at the time when the child became old enough, after winning the child, she gave the child unto the Lord. Now, you cannot give unto the Lord and remain empty-handed. Hello, somebody. Amen. This same woman, Anna, who was called barren, she gave Samuel to God. In return, God gave her many other children. Yes. Not one, not two, not three, not four. God gave her five more children. You can find that in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 21. Three sons and two daughters. Well, because she gave Samuel unto the Lord. You cannot do business with God and, and, and lose. Hello, somebody. Amen. Now, let's look at the story of Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 26. The Bible says, And the child Samuel grew in stature and in favor with both the Lord and men. He grew in stature. There's what we call physical stature, and there's another thing that we call spiritual stature. Both are relevant. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, the Bible says, For bodily exercise profits a little. But godliness, in place of god godliness, you can also put spirituality. Godliness is profitable for all things. Having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. 
Hello, somebody. Now, let's look at the message translation. I love the way the message translation puts that scripture. Message translation says, workouts in the gymnasium, in the gym, are useful. But a disciplined life in God is far more so. Hello, somebody. How many of us go to the gym to work out? You know, to lift weight, to build the biceps and the triceps and the six-pack. Uh, even though you have one pack now, but one pack can become six-pack. And so you go to the gym to shed some weight and all that to keep fit. Now the Bible says that, yes, as good as that is, spiritual exercise is much more important. Look at message translation. It says, making you fit both today and forever. Hello, somebody. So apart from being physically fit, the Lord is saying, you've got to be spiritually fit. Say to the Lord, you've got to be spiritually fit. Be spiritually fit. That's what the scripture is telling us here. And so spiritual fitness is key. You have to develop your spiritual muscles. Growing muscles doesn't happen by accident. You can't keep eating pounded yam and expect to, grow, expect to grow muscles. You have to build those muscles. Similarly, spiritual growth doesn't happen by chance. You have to engage in activities that will build you up spiritually. In Luke chapter 1 verse 80, the Bible says, So the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the desert till the day of his manifestation to Israel. That was talking about John the Baptist. The child grew and he became strong in the spirit. Now the spirit there is not talking about the Holy Spirit. It's talking about your spirit, our own spirit. Man is a spirit, we have a soul and we dwell, excuse me, we dwell in a body. So you've got to be strong in your spirit. And John, was, he, he was strong in the spirit, and that prepared him for his future. He was in the wilderness until the day of his manifestation to Israel. You've got to be strong in your spirit until the day that you will be manifested to your world. You've got to be strong until you have to be strong so that you can have sufficient capacity to fulfill your divine purpose and an assignment here on earth. In Luke chapter 2, verse 40, the Bible told us about Jesus, the Son of God. And the child grew. Exactly the same words. Became strong in spirit. Now, I'm laying, deliberately laying emphasis of, on being strong in the spirit there. Because, you see, if you're not strong in the spirit, the Bible says, those who know their God, they shall be what? Strong. And they shall do exploits. Spirituality is a platform for exploits in the kingdom of God. If you're not strong spiritually, you cannot do exploit for him. Those who know that God will be strong and they will do exploit for him. Now, Jesus was also filled with wisdom. And the grace of God was upon him. Sometimes we ask for grace. But do you know that you can deliberately multiply the grace of God upon your life? Hello, somebody. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ our Lord. So the more you know Jesus, the Bible says Jesus is full of grace, of truth and grace. In fact, he is grace personified. So the more you know about Jesus, the more you receive grace. So grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Savior. So the more you know Jesus, the more grace is multiplied to you. Again, if you go to Luke chapter 2, verse 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. Stature, they can call it either physical stature or spiritual stature because gold, both are relevant. And he found favor with God and men. Like I said on Thursday during House of Grace, you cannot be more anointed than your level of spirituality. The more spiritual you become, the more anointed you get. It's like saying that, you know, back in the days when we used to watch wrestling. How many, you know, back in the days, WWF? Aha. Uh -huh. Many, no, it used to be WWF then. Uh, it's, not, it's not like WWE. It used to be WWF in the days of Hulk Hogan and, and, and the Ultimate Warrior. 
You know, he was my favorite. And, and so many of them. And so we have world heavyweight champion. And we have lightweight championship. Also, we have money in the bag. And Royal Rumble and the rest of them. Now, you cannot fight in a lightweight championship and expect to win a heavyweight belt. It's not possible. Now, similarly, you cannot have a lightweight, you cannot be lightweight in your spirit and expect to receive a heavyweight anointing. It's not possible. So therefore, you have to be heavyweight in your spirit for you to receive heavyweight anointing. Therefore, it's a higher call to us. Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to the high call of God in Christ Jesus. There's a high call of God upon your life. Please help me preach to two people and tell them there's a high call of God upon your life. Okay, now some of us are not doing this, okay. Uh, you know, this is where it gets to me. I'm going to ask you to rise up and give three people a high five and tell them that you have a high call of God upon your life. Therefore, you have to answer that call. Three people, come on, go quickly, amen. Yeah, high call of God upon your life. There's a high call. <clears throat> There's a high call. And so we have to heed that call. Amen. Now it's a call to greater heights. Okay, I'm announcing the theme for the anniversary now. That's the theme for the anniversary, greater heights. Hallelujah. That's the theme for that. I'm not supposed to say this, but I'm saying it right now. It's called, the theme is greater height. Now, God is calling us to greater height. There's a higher call. There's a higher call. Our anniversary is happening in November by the grace of God. Everything is settled by His grace. Now, there's a higher call of God upon our life, upon your life. Therefore, you have to desire a deeper walk. Because the deeper you go in God, the higher you rise in life. Therefore, the reason why we fast and pray is to keep our spirit in tune and sensitive. The reason why we engage in in-depth study of the Word is for us to gain spiritual insight, revelation knowledge, and grace is multiplied unto us. Do you know you can read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and not get insight? You just read it and no insight is forthcoming. And that's because the Holy Spirit uses spiritual things. He compares spiritual things with spiritual. I will get to that in a moment. If you don't understand spiritual things, you cannot understand the things of the Spirit. The Holy Ghost uses Scripture to teach Scriptures. So the more you know Scriptures or the more you know the things of God, the deeper your walk with God can become. And we sit together here. We worship to maintain his presence and his anointing upon our lives. We engage in soul winning to gladden the heart of the Father. And we commit to our local church to edify the body of Christ. All these activities help to increase or facilitate our spiritual growth. Now the one I'm really particular about is companionship. Luke chapter 3 verse 7. Sorry, uh, first so much of the three, verse seven. The Bible said, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord revealed to him. First Samuel 3 7. He did not yet know the Lord. Now remember, before this verse, Samuel had been ministering to the Lord. He had been ministering to the Lord, but at that time he had the word of the God of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Now, what I'm saying here is that. Developing intimacy is a process. It doesn't happen overnight. Yes, you've prayed for two hours or three hours. You've not heard the voice of the Holy Spirit and you feel like, you know what, I want to quit. This thing is not working. It will take time. A child doesn't recognize, you know, a child learns how to talk by talking. They learn how to walk by walking. Similarly, we learn how to recognize the voice of the Holy Spirit by waiting on him to hear his voice. It doesn't happen overnight. Samuel had been ministering to the Lord. But the Bible says, for the word of the Lord was yet to be revealed to him. So it's a process. Sometimes you could fast and pray three days waiting on God, but yet you've not heard the voice of God. But it could be the fourth day that the Lord would speak to you. But tarry in his presence. Hallelujah. Tarry in his presence. 
wait on him. You wake up in the morning. You share fellowship with the Lord. Don't be in a hurry. Or have in the day of, of the week, or have a day during the week whereby you wait on him. The Lord, this day is the day of the Lord. I'm going to wait on you. A day where you fast and pray. And you could also have it as a routine because, again, you go to the gym. I mean, for those of us who go to the gym, I don't go to the gym anymore. I have, um, what is it called? I have a kind of an app that I use right now and it's really, really good. You have to stick to the plan. You know, they, they have uh, 30 days. If you, there's a part of your body you want to work on, you like, you can do it for 30 days and begin to see changes in your body. And so instead of paying 30 pounds to the gym, I just follow that app and it's working. Hello, somebody. Now, the app has daily routine that you have to keep up. You have to keep up with the daily routine. Similarly, for you to grow in your work with God, you have to stick to a routine. Hello, somebody. Let someone say routine. routine. I can't hear you say routine. You have to stick to daily routine. Or it could be weekly routine. It could be monthly routine. Now, there are categories of routine. There are daily routines. Whatever you have to pray. You can't pray once in a week. Hello, somebody. You can't pray. You can't study the word of God once in a week. No, you will die. You have to feed on the word on daily basis. You have to pray on daily basis. Now, fasting, you don't have to fast on daily basis. Although some people say they live a fasted life. You know, you can fast once in a week. And you can say, okay, every month I want to wait on the Lord three days in a, in, 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 uh, three days on a row. I want to wait on the Lord every month. That's a way to like really fine-tune your spiritual, your work with God. You can say every day I want to read like maybe a chapter or two or three or four chapters of the Bible on daily basis. You can want to, you want to say I want to commit to reading a book per month. You can choose a subject. I want to understand more about kingdom finances. Then you get a book per month to read and so on. All these routines have to be put in place for you to see growth in your work with God. Are we still together? Now, let's look at the outcome of Samuel's ministry. Samuel's ministry to the Lord. Let's see the outcome. If you go to 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 19 to 21. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 19 to 21. Is someone getting blessed here? 1 Samuel chapter 3. I will read from verse 19 to 21. Let's look at the outcome of the ministry of Samuel to the Lord. So Samuel grew and the Lord was with him. In other words, he carried the presence of God. And let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel had been established a prophet of the Lord. Then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. For the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. So the Lord can reveal himself to you through his word. As the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Now, when Samuel's mother, Hannah, made a covenant with God, he said, God, give me this child, I will give him back to you. Now, when after she win the child, normally in Israel, they win children around the ages two to three. And so after winning the child around age three, she handed over the child to, to the priest, to Eli. And Eli began, and if you go back to 1 Samuel chapter 3, the Bible says, and the child began to minister to the Lord. In fact, if you go to uh, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 11. The Elkanah went to his house at Ramah, but the child ministered to the Lord before Eli, the priest. Now, bear in mind, this child was about age three, ministering to the Lord. To the Lord. Imagine someone like my son, David. David is about two plus. Now, a child three years old, ministering to the Lord. Now, if you go to 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 18, let's read. But Samuel ministered before the Lord even as a child, wearing a linen effort. So again, as a child, age three, he was ministering to the Lord. So don't feel or think that our children are too young to minister to God. Don't feel that way because it is deception and the lie of the devil also think when we are praying, our children should be playing. No. When you're having devotion, you feel okay, our children, they don't really understand, but thief, 
please make them do it. It will become part of them. When, we, when my son sees me reading my Bible in the morning, she goes to the bookshelf and goes, get any book and start reading. That's David. And just keep flipping through the pages of the book. He doesn't really understand it, but he knows there's a tradition here. There's a routine. There's a culture in this family engaging in the study of the word. Get them used to it. The child Samuel, now whilst the sons of Eli were misbehaving and, uh, you know, the Bible said they were corrupt, Samuel grew in stature. He was strong in the spirit. Why? Because he ministered to God. And they both grew in the same environment. Hello, somebody. They grew in the same environment, environment. Eli, Hopney, and Phinehas grew in the same house as Samuel. But Samuel turned out to be good. Why? Because he, he ministered to the Lord. So when you are praying, don't allow your children to keep playing. Engage them. Teach them how to pray. Teach them the word. And that way they will grow in the knowledge and in the fear of the Lord. Now, so still talking about companion, uh, companionship, you see, it has to do with spending time in the presence of God. So fellowshipping or spending time with the Holy Spirit will lead to the second factor. I'm talking about three factors that facilitate intimacy with the Holy Spirit. The second one is knowledge. Let someone say knowledge. Now, we feel more comfortable to share deep and private information with people we are close to. We share our secrets, past histories, fears, pains, dreams, desires, and goals with them. Why? Because we can trust them. Furthermore, we share such personal information with them because we are in need of their advice. Or maybe we need their support. Or we want to be accountable to them. Or we just want someone we want to share, we feel safe to open up to. Now, without companionship or fellowship, such information exchange is not feasible. Therefore, companionship breeds information sharing. Hello, somebody. You cannot begin to share some private or personal information with someone you don't know. Hello, church. So when we get close to someone, when we share fellowship with people, we begin to grow affinity, we begin to love them, we can begin to trust them, and then we can now begin to share certain knowledge with them. Similarly, when we share fellowship with the Holy Spirit, he shares knowledge with us. Jesus said, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends because a servant does not know what his master is doing. In James chapter 2, verse 23, the scripture tells us about Abraham, how Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Hello, somebody. Can you imagine being called the friend of God? Abraham was called the friend of God. In fact, God said, can I do this thing and sin again? I mean, can I do this thing and not tell my friend Abraham? If you go to Genesis chapter 18, let's go there quickly. Genesis 18, verse 17 to 19. Genesis 18, if you had to say amen. Okay, not everyone is there yet. Genesis chapter 18, verse 17 to 19. Okay, let's start from verse 16. Then the men arose rose from there and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them. Those are three men. And to send them on the way. Three men came straight. They were complete strangers. They vis we know the story. They visited Abraham. And Abraham entertained them. Not knowing that actually the Lord was with this people. These people were not ordinary people. He entertained them. And the Lord gave him a word that, see, your wife, Sarah, will conceive. Now, at the end of the day, the Bible said these men were about to leave and Abraham did not just send them like, away like that. He began to escort them. And then, again, that talks about companionship. And then verse 17 says, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him, for I have known him. Now take note, I have known him. That means that 
God knows Abraham so much. Now, that's not talking just not just talking about uh, because God knows he, pre, he, 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 he made us, so he knows everything about us. But there's this knowing that we can get from interacting with people. Hello, somebody. The more you spend time with me, the more you know me. The more I spend time with you, the more I know you. And so God is saying to Abraham, it's saying here, I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. Now, can I submit to you that God is counting on you to command your children, your family, after him? He's counting on you. So don't just say, oh, because they're little kids, they can't do anyhow, do anything and get away with it. You have to command them. Hello? Amen. Amen. We have to. And God said, I have known him. So Abraham commanded Isaac. Isaac became great. Isaac commanded Jacob. Jacob became great. Jacob commanded Joseph. Joseph became great. That's why Joseph was able to say, how can I do this thing and sin against my God? There was no Bible in those days. There was no Bible. There was no church. But the father, the parents had taught him. At the age of 17, he was sold into slavery. So his knowledge of God was about the things that his parents had taught him and also his own personal work with God. Hello, somebody here. So it's something that we have to labor to train our children. The Bible says, train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he's old, he will do what? He will not depart from it. And that's what happened to Joseph. Joseph in slavery, he didn't have father, he didn't have mother, he didn't have anyone. There was no church. There were people who didn't like him. He didn't understand their language. He was a stranger, complete stranger in that land. It was just him and God. And the Bible says he became a prosperous man, not because he had money in the bank, no, because the Lord was with him. And so God, so Abraham began to, now look at what God said. Uh, if we go to Verse 20. Now, remember, there are three men. Two of them went to destroy Sodom, which were angels. Now, the third person was actually the Lord. Now, the Bible says no one has seen God at any time except the Son of God who came from him. So, the person Abraham was talking to here wasn't God as in God in his form, the almighty God. It was Jesus. Am I boring you? Hello? Okay, can I have a smile? Amen. Praise God. Abraham was talking to Jesus. Because he stood with him. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Nobody can see God. Jesus, nobody has ever seen God at any time. Except the son who came from him. Abraham or Moses that we thought saw God did not see God. Because he can't see God and live. But now, the Lord now began to have a conversation with Abraham. I, Lord, I want to get to that point. The Lord said, I want to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham said, Lord, but if, what if there are 50 people in that place? God said, I will not destroy it. And then Abraham said, Lord, I'm sorry, but I just need to satisfy my curiosity. What if there are 40 people? Would you still destroy the land? And the Lord said, no, I would not. And Abraham said, but okay, what about 30 and 20 and 10? You were having that conversation, and you can see the tenderness of the Lord. You can see the kindness of the Lord. The Lord did not get angry. Again, bear in mind, it was the same Lord. Sarah lied. When Sarah, the Lord said, you will have a child. And Sarah said, she laughed, she scoffed and said, how can a woman of my age give birth to a child? And the Lord said, Sarah, you laughed. And Sarah said, I did not laugh. Can you try that with God and live? It was Jesus, the all-compassionate one, full of kindness, loving tender. You can't try that with God. Because God is a consuming fire. But Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He was the one that was talking to Abraham. And you know, again, still talking about intimacy. Intimacy. And oh Jesus. Let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9 to 14. 
Lord, take me deeper. Take me deeper with you, Lord. Take me deeper in walk with you. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 to 14. Okay, but as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Question, do you love God? Now, God has prepared beautiful, wonderful things, fantastic things for you. Now, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. Now, this is revealed to us through intimacy with the Holy Spirit. You remember, I'm talking about the subject knowledge. These things are revealed to, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know knowledge, know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So the Holy Spirit teaches us things, and what he teaches us are spiritual things. So what he does is that he compares spiritual things with spiritual. So that means it's like saying the Bible says knowledge is easy to him who has understanding. Let's say the more you know, sometimes when I when I teach, uh, I was teaching a session one day in uni, and I was using some terminologies, and a student kept on asking me, okay, what is the meaning of what you just said now? Okay, I will explain it. They carry on teaching it, then she will ask the same question, what is the meaning of what you just said? And she kept on interrupting my last scene. And I felt okay, but again, I didn't get offended. I had to like explain all those terminologies to her. Now, if she knew those terminologies, it would be easier for her to understand what I was saying to them. Similarly, if you want to understand spiritual things, you have to have vocabulary, a repository of spiritual things. Because the Holy Spirit compares spiritual things with spiritual. It takes scripture to interpret scriptures. The more scriptures you know, the more you're able to understand the scriptures. The Bible says, little, uh, 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 a, a, a little precept upon precept, line upon line, a little here, a little there. So the more you begin to know, the Lord begins to like compare spiritual things with spiritual. In fact, if you go to the next verse, please give me verse 14. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. In other words, if we live in the flesh, we cannot understand the things of the Spirit. But, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them. Now, go back to verse 14. Because they are spiritually discerned, meaning that spiritual things, the things of the Spirit can only be assessed spiritually. So the more spiritual you become, the more you're able to assess the things of the Spirit. Amen. Let's go to the last factor, which is uh, obedience. So the first one is the first one. Companionship. Number two, knowledge. And number three is obedience. John chapter 14, verse 15. Jesus said, if you love me, obey my commandments. Then I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. Again, that speaks of intimacy. If you go to verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me. <clears throat> and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So when we commune with the Lord, when we share fellowship with the Lord and then we obey his commandments, we do what he says to us to do, he will manifest himself to us through encounters, encounters and dreams in revelations and so on and so forth. Now, the condition here is obedience. He who has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me. So, a proof of your love is in obedience. The Bible says, and Solomon loved the Lord, and he gave a thousand of burnt offering. True relationships are tested, or will be tested, 
A relationship that isn't tested cannot be trusted. And look at Abraham. Look at what God said to Abraham in Genesis chapter 22. When God said to Abraham, Abraham, take your son. The son whom you love. God emphasized, take your son. Your only son. The son whom you love. Take him to a mountain that I will show you. And sacrifice him there. <clears throat> Hello. Intimacy. So for Abraham to be called the friend of God, there is a price to pay. How many of us want to be called the friend of God? There are levels of relationships. There's a parallel level kind of relationship in the living room. You know, you can play games together, but you can't enter my bedroom. Okay, because my bedroom is, you know, is an intimate place. And so to have bedroom discussion, there's a level of intimacy. Now, if you want to get to that deep, holy of holies kind of relationship with God, you must be willing to make some sacrifices. Hello, somebody. Obedience. And so God said to Abraham, take your only son. Now, Abraham did not argue. He did not give any excuse. He did not try to explain to say, God, but, you know, I've waited for this child for 25 years. Uh, why, Lord, can you, why sh should I do this? He did not even say, God, what will I get in return if I offer him? Because that's what we do sometimes. When we give offering, Lord, I'm putting this in the ground. What I want in return is, you know, you begin to name the things we want, our expectations. Abraham did not do any of those things. Immediately, the following morning, early in the morning, he saddled his donkey, took two servants and his son, and they left. He didn't even tell his wife. Hello. Because if he had told Sarah, <laughs> he wouldn't just say Isaac again. <laughs> he didn't tell his wife. What a true test. And then when he was about to offer the child, the Bible says, the angel of the Lord cried from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, do not lay a finger on the child. Now I know that you fear me. And you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. In blessing, I will bless you. In multiplication, I will multiply you. It was at that point that God said, you know what? This guy will remain my friend forever. Now, talking about obedience, what is the Holy Spirit telling you? What is he asking you to let go? Abraham did not withhold his son. Maybe what you're withholding from him is one, a habit or a lifestyle. Or certain things you are doing, and you know that these things are wrong. The Lord is saying that you have to let go of these things. If you love me, obey my commandments. And that's how you can grow intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So your intimacy with the Holy Spirit will be tested. Joseph said, how can I do this thing and sin against my God? Daniel said, I have purpose in my heart not to defile myself with the king's portion of meat and drink. Oh, the three Hebrew boys said that, said that our God whom we serve is able to deliver us, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar. Even if he does not deliver us, we will still not bow. And look at all these men. The Bible says, and Job feared the Lord, and he eschewed evil. Now all these men, look at their lives. They became great. You cannot walk with God and not become great. God is a mighty God. You cannot walk with God and not become mighty. But there are things you have to let go. Amen. Amen. Now, there are two things I really want to talk about, and I will close. Now, these two things can hinder your walk with the Holy Spirit. If you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, the Bible says, Do not quench the Holy Spirit. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. What do we mean by quenching? Quench is used to, like, you know, if you want to uh, extinguish fire, you want to quench fire, you just quench. Now, the quench that is talking about the effect, the influence of the Holy Spirit upon your life. If you set this thing on fire, what happens? The influence, it begins to spread until everything is consumed. So the Holy Spirit has influencing power over us. Now, the Bible is saying that do not quench him. In other words, do not put him off. <clears throat> How do we quench the Holy Spirit? What do we do that can make us quench him? Whenever he tells you to do things and you don't do those things, you're quenching him. Whenever he's giving you a nudge, prompting you to make a move, and you're not making that move, you're quenching him. Whenever you disobey him, you're quenching him. 
You are quenching his influence upon your life. You and your spouse had an argument. And the Lord is telling the Holy Spirit is telling, telling you, go and make peace with him. Go and make peace with her. And you're reluctant to do it. You are quenching him. And what happens is the more you quench him, the less effect he would have on you. The less the effects. Because we're ignoring him. And that way you cannot grow intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Time will not permit me to quickly to talk about, you know, how the Holy Spirit speaks or leads to us. I'll leave that for another day. Now, the second thing I would like to talk about is grieving the Holy Spirit. That can be found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 to 22. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 to 22. It says here that, doo -doo -doo -doo, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Now, what does it mean to grieve the Holy Spirit? To grieve, it means to make him sorrowful. You know the kind of feeling you have for those of us who are married? When your spouse hurts you or offends you, for me, it's as if I cannot breathe. When my wife and we're not in good times, it's as though I cannot breathe. It's as if I'm about to die. You know, it feels, I, there's a grief. My heart gets heavy. I feel so grieved in my heart. And all I want is, let's make peace. I'm craving for this. I'm dying for the let's make peace. That's how the Holy Spirit feels when you grieve him. And when we grieve him, we grieve him by walking in the flesh. When we lie, when we become angry, when we keep malice. When, remember what about, if you look at the context, that's why it's not good to take scriptures out of context. If you look at the context of what Paul was saying, he started by saying, that do, he started by saying let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for edification. Each time you say what is not befitting, you are grieving the Holy Spirit. Each time you insult or abuse people or you gossip, you are grieving the Holy Spirit. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. Now, he now went on to say, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, verse 31. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you. Because whenever you do those things, you are grieving him. And remember what we said earlier about companionship. We want to spend time with people that love us, people that appreciate us. I'm not talking about this flower, but, you know, the people that appreciate us, people that love, you want to spend time with, with them. But do you want to spend time with people that grieve your heart? Do you want to spend time with people that grieve, that make you feel unhappy? No. You withdraw from them. And that's what happens. The Holy Spirit has withdrawn from many of us because we keep grieving him. You want to hear his voice? You can't hear his voice because your lifestyle is not in alignment. But the Bible now says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away with all malice and be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So if you can put all those things in place and desire fresh work with the Holy Spirit, He can get close to you. And little, little things that we do that we feel these things are not important, but actually they can grieve the Holy Spirit. You're in church. People are worshiping or praying or doing someone, and you're on Facebook or WhatsApp and all that. You are grieving the Holy Spirit. Because here, for example, if you go to the to law court, as in to the courtroom, they don't allow mobile phones. They don't. The judge can actually walk you out if you're with a mobile phone in the law court. How much more the judge of all the earth? And so we need to reference God. We need to reference the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you are ministering, and the Holy Spirit can just depart if you have a wrong motive. Or when you're ministering and you're, all you're conscious about is your hair, you know, I want to hear to, you know, or conscious of your looks. And the Holy Spirit is saying, what I'm doing here is more important than your looks. It's not about you. It's about Jesus because that is the role of the Holy Spirit, to glorify Jesus. And once you want to take the glory to yourself, he just walks away. Amen. 
So I pray that as we grow to become more intimate and sensitive to the Holy Spirit, I pray that we will become more like Christ. And the main purpose of the Holy Spirit in our life will be manifested, and that is to glorify Jesus. In summary, three factors that facilitate intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Number one, companionship. Number two, knowledge. And number three, obedience. Amen.